Hey guys, it's Sam. Welcome back to The Blind Life, where I help you learn how to live your best blind life. Today, I've got a special video for you guys. I'm having a conversation with some friends of mine, uh, and we're going to be talking about when to divulge your vision impairment to a potential employer. Hang on, we'll be right back. All right, guys. So I am joined with uh, two friends of mine. As I said, we have Fernando Albatorio, serial entrepreneur, scientist, all around awesome guy. Uh, <laughs> and Derek Daniel, founder of lifeaftersightloss.com and the Life After Sight Loss YouTube channel. Well known on the channel. Derek's been on here a ton of times. Um, first of all, thank you guys, both of you guys for joining me today. Happy to be here. Happy to be here, Sam. Thanks. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about a topic that uh, I, I get this question all the time from my audience. I'm sure you guys do too in, in one way or another. Fernando, I believe you've written the whole papers and things about this topic. So I'd love to talk about that. But it's when to divulge your vision impairment, uh, mainly during the hiring process for a new employment or a new employer? Um, do you tell them right away? Do you wait until you're further along in the process? It's, it's, a, it's a big question. And um, I, I, like I said, I wanted to get you guys together and just talk about experiences because we all have, some of us have slightly similar experiences, but we've got a good range here. Uh, Fernando has been visually impaired since birth. And so he has every single job and working experience that he's done. He's had to deal with this situation. Uh, I have as well. Uh, well, not since birth, but, um, you know, I was a kid when I started losing my sight. And then Derek, if I'm not mistaken, did have some work prior to losing your vision. So this, this, this problem kind of came later in life. Is that right, Derek? That is right. Yeah, so I think we've got a nice little range of experiences here, but um, here, I'll go first. Uh, I'll talk about my, my thoughts on the, the matter. Uh, first thing I always like to tell people is it's a very personal decision, right? There's no wrong or right answer to this. Uh, it, you kind of have to go with your guts on it. Um, my personal philosophy is not to wait too long through the hiring process. Um, you know, you, you kind of don't want to, and once again, just my opinion, I, I think you don't want to wait until you're already hired. They've got you all set up in the position and it's like your first day and you just drop the ball on them. Hey, you know, I, I need a, I need a large print monitor. You got to get jaws for my computer, all of this stuff. Uh, so I personally think it's better to, uh, let them know a little earlier in the process, um, what do you guys think? Either one of you guys can jump in. Fernando, oh, I'll, de I'll default to you. Oh, <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that by sharing a story. Uh, this is like right out of college. I did my degree in chemistry, um, had a bunch of research experience while I was an undergraduate and actually got, got a lot of hands-on uh, in the lab experience. So by the time I came out of college, I applied to work at the government uh, in one of the government labs. Uh, and I don't want to provide too much detail about where and who, <laughs> um, but basically to get the job, you know, I had to do interviews. I had to do, um, you know, a lot of the interviews were, uh, kind of like tests. They were testing me about my knowledge of analytical chemistry, lab procedures and all that stuff. And so out of the candidates that applied, which were, I think over, over 30 of candidates that they selected me to, to fill the role of, of a research fellow. Uh, so I arrived there my very first week. Uh, and in my well, my third day there, uh, met the met the basically the the principal investigator for the lab, and you know it was a fellow with an MD PhD, uh, great credentials. Looked at me and said, "Boy, I wish I would have seen you during your interview because I would not have hired you, knowing mm. that you have a vision impairment." And so that to me was a whole education about what my future career and how I had to manage my uh, uh, career uh, throughout moving forward. And the way I handled that, uh, even being so young uh, and naive as well and green, uh, was I told him, I said, look, you know, I 
he selected me because of something that I did during the interview. I passed all your tests. I showed experience, credentials. Give me a chance to work in your lab. I will show you that I can do the work here better than any other researcher in the lab. And I stayed there for two and a half years. But even though I stayed there for two and a half years, I will still remember that experience. And that's something that I took with me throughout. And it kind of informed uh, my philosophy in terms of how uh, and when you should address your, your, your sight impairment during, during an interview. And then what did that teach you about that? What do you do now? Lesson number one, it taught me to own my own story, own the narrative. You, your disability is your own story um, and you should control that disability. Though I interviewed and I passed all the tests that they threw at me, um, the one thing that I didn't do then was own my narrative. Um, and one of the things that I recommend people is number one, yes, focus on the interviewer. You're there to interview for that company or for that role. Show them that you've got the credentials, you've got um, experience, expertise, maybe you're a subject matter expert in that role. Show that in your interview. But also then, if you want to bring up your disability, which I think you should, find it the right moment during the interview to do so. And sometimes there are breaks in the interview when an interviewer will ask you, tell me about a challenge that you've had to overcome. Find that right moment and you control the narrative of your disability. But also don't make it about you because the interview is not just about you. It's about the company trying to fit a role and they're trying to see if you're the right match, both professionally, experience-wise, and then culturally. So talk about your disability in the frame of how you uh, are a perfect fit for that role and exude confidence when doing it. Yeah, yeah, very good. Derek, what do you think? Any Anything to add or, or disagree? Yeah. No, I think, first of all, I, I hate following Fernando now because he's like... <laughs> you told him to go first, too. It was your fault. <laughs> I know. What a, what a bad choice. That was. Uh, he's like, you know, working at a lab. And I'm like, I, I did shows. Like, I, that was my first job. I worked as an entertainer at a theme park. So um, anyway, we, to each their own, I guess. But no, uh, when I first started working, I was cited, as Sam mentioned, and you just never considered any of that. And actually, I lost my sight while I was working at this theme park, and uh, they were very gracious and very kind, and I knew them as sort of like a family, and it was a small town, so we all knew each other. And so for that, I didn't really have any issues transitioning from being sighted to blind within the job because I knew the job. They knew I could do the job. It didn't really matter. But then going into new jobs and new locations and so forth, uh, you know, applying for things, uh, I had to think, just like Fernando said, I had to think like, um, what is my story and how am I going to tell that to people? And my first thought is always, look, I'm not going to apply for this job if I think I can't do the job. Like, I'm not going to apply to be a truck driver or, you know, a pilot or something. That's just, that, that's, I'm not going to apply for that job. So if I'm applying for it, you know, at least you should know that I can probably do this job. There might have to be some, you know, things that take place like a magnifier, like, you know, a large screen, whatever, but I can do the job because I wouldn't apply if I didn't think so. Uh, my philosophy is always I tell them as soon as I can. And the reason I do that is so that there's never a point in the interview where they feel like I've lied to them or hidden something from them. Now, I'm not suggesting they will think that. I just don't want them to think that. I don't want to walk in after two phone interviews with my guide dog and they're like, wait a minute, you, you never mentioned this. Were you hiding? What else are you hiding from me? You know, and that sort of thing. I don't want to start that relationship off like that. That's just my personal thing. I'm a very relational person. I try to make a connection with the interviewer, interviewee, interviewer kind of thing. And I, I want to make that connection. And I don't ever want them to feel like I've lied. Now, at the end of the day, if they feel like I can do the job great, or I can't do the job great based on my sight, that's not, shouldn't be an issue. That's discrimination. And that shouldn't happen. Um, for example, I, I applied at a school a few years ago, and the job was sort of a uh, receptionist, secretarial kind of position. And one of the jobs they had to do was watch over the in-school suspension kids. This was like at a middle school. And they were very concerned that those in-school suspension kids would take advantage of my sight loss, <laughs> which I couldn't argue. I'm like, they probably would. I mean, my own children <laughs> do the same. And that was just one of their major concerns. The rest of it, 
I, I think, you know, wasn't an issue, but they were struggling with that. And, and, you know, they were very kind and gracious and, and I don't, I think I probably didn't get the job for that reason, but it, it wasn't some, it wasn't like a discrimination kind of reason or anything. It was like, we don't like you because you're blind. It wasn't like that. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, I think we just have to go, you know what, I'm applying for this job, which means I think I can do the job. And I want you to know, you know, for me, I want them to know up front. That way, if they're walking through the interview process with me, there's nothing hidden. There's nothing. They can ask me questions about it. How, how do you, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? You know, at my current job, they ask me questions, you know, um, how are you going to use the computer? How are you going to use the software? How are you going to, whatever? It's like, oh, and I've got answers for them left and right because I'm prepared. And that's just my philosophy. Yeah. And, and especially for people who have, um, whose disability isn't well noticeable. In other words, sometimes it's sure. you the word hidden disabilities, right? Sometimes people will look at me and they won't even know that I have albinism. Um, they just think, oh, he's just a very blonde dude, probably from California. Uh, no, <laughs> um, so uh, you know, it's trickier when it's not really well noticeable, or you need like an MD PhD in order to know that oh, this person has ocular cutaneous albinism, and so therefore he's legally blind, right? So most people in the interview seat uh, or in the interviewer role may not be aware of that. And I agree with with what you're saying is like you know you have to think about this relationally. If you can bring it up. You can be also a little bit strategic about when you bring it up, owning your narrative. It shows a couple of things. It shows, number one, that you care about that relationship. It also shows that you have good management skills, that you can manage a topic in, in, in bringing up this uh, important uh, thing, which is your disability and how this relates to your role, and that you can actually manage that in a discussion. So you have to the, that signals to the company, to the interviewer, that you have really good social, um, social and soft skills, which is something you know, which are things that employers look for as well yeah. as the hard skills for the role. I totally agree. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think we're all in agreement <clears throat> that um, it's really something that should come up early on in the in the process. I mean, you don't have to walk through the door, shake a hand, and say, "Hey, I'm Sam, and I'm blind." Uh, you know, <laughs> Derek, Derek coming in with a guide dog, it's going to be pretty yeah. obvious, but, sure. um, find some way at some point during that early on process to let them know. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. It's, it's like, like Fernando says, you can work it in as one of those, uh, you know, challenges in your life. Well, you know, I was diagnosed with a vision impairment early on and, and I've had to work hard to, you know, make my way and, and, uh, but. Yeah, like Derek said, if you are confident you can do the job, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, it shouldn't be a big deal. And then, but then, like I said before, I I just the same thing. I I I, I feel a little dishonest if you were to go throughout the entire process not saying anything, and then yeah, walk in the first day with your guide dog, and uh, <laughs> they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> And you'll have an experience like Fernando did there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One other, one other thing that I found useful is in the questions, because sometimes at the interview at the end, they'll ask you, you know, do you have any questions about the role? Um, this is a time also where, you know, you can control the narrative uh, uh, as well and ask them, hey, are there, is there anything that I haven't mentioned that, you know, uh, that you want to have, that you want to know about my ability to do this role? And so then now you put you put them that that serves them up with the opportunity to address issues, maybe concerns. Well, maybe we're concerned about students and how they'll take advantage of your um, your limited vision, or maybe mm -hmm. it's about how you will work on a computer. What have you done for that? And again, that is an opportunity for you to show how you've. Uh, manage to like either use JAWS on your computer or you have a braille display or you have magnifiers or any other adaptive aids that you can bring into to, to the work and meet them halfway because also sometimes you know people may be concerned about well how much is it going to cost to bring you on and they can't they can't talk about that because obviously because of ADA right uh, in, especially in this country um, and, and so it really is a good opportunity for you to throw the question back at them and start really kind of addressing those, those elephants in the room. 
Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's a really good point. You know, um, have them figure it out. I remember when in my interview, I was showing them different things on the computer and telling them, and they were kind of like, oh, really? I mean, they had no idea. I would say for the most part, unless your interviewer has interacted with somebody who's blind, they're probably not even going to think about like how you can actually do it. Like, how do you use a smartphone? How do you use a computer? Right. And then you say a few things and they're like, oh, that, okay, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. And it starts to ease their mind a bit when you can demonstrate how you actually can do the job. Um, and, and the other thing I think for me is I want them to see, for lack of a better word, I want them to see past uh, my disability and to see me. You know, I, yes, I'm blind. Let's get through all that junk up front. Okay, how am I going to use a computer? How am I going to do that? Okay, great. Now let's get to see me because I'm the one getting the job, not my disability. I'm the one you're going to interact with on a day in, day out basis, not my disability. In fact, most of the time at any job I've had, after the first couple of days, people just forget that I have a disability and they're just interacting with me. And so I, my hope is that they're interviewing me because anybody else they interview that doesn't have a disability, they're not, they're not having that barrier to get past with uh, blindness or whatever else. And so for me, I've got that extra layer that I've got to have them get through. So it's like, you know what? Let's get through it first. Let's just have all the questions and uh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> okay, now, boom, it's just me and you're not worried about my disability anymore. So that's just my thought. You know, it's like I was, because they're not going to interact with a blind guy, uh, you know, at their work, they're going to interact with Derek or Fernando or Sam. They're going to interact with that person, not my disability. It's going to be part of me. Sure. It's part of my story. As Fernando said, it's part of my narrative, but it's only one part. And so I always want to get that, you know, up front and out of the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. emphasize... Oh, okay. uh, I, I emphasize the um, being an advocate for your, yourself and um, just like both of you guys said, you know, uh, uh, telling them exactly what you might need, showing them. I think a lot of them are going to, for, for most of us, low vision users or people, we can use the uh, tech that's already pre-installed on the computer or on the phone and get by with that. Um, so I think as um, Fernando mentioned, you know, the, the cost of bringing on a blind person, that's definitely going to be in the back of their, their minds. And so maybe you can uh, relieve a little bit of that, that stress or that question by saying, yeah, you've already got a lot of this on your computer pre-installed. We don't have to do anything here. Um, but definitely be an advocate. If there's something you need, let them know. One other thing that I also uh, do or, and, or, and also recommend for folks when, when we talk about this topic is, is, you know, as you mentioned, you know, getting over the, the hurdle or the barrier of, am I, I'm hiring for the disability or am I hiring you, right? Um, sometimes it's hard for people to see past the disability um, and you got to do a bit of extra work to get them to see past that and then see you for your abilities and for who you are. Um, and one thing that I recommend is like, you know, tie in some of the, the abilities that you've created that have enabled you because of, you know, your sight impairment or your low vision. In other words, you know, your resiliency, uh, your adaptability, um, your problem solving skills. One of the things that I did, you know, when I was interviewing for different lab posi positions as researchers and throughout my scientific career, um, and technical career is that, you know, I, I would always say, I say I'm a very good hacker. I can take any instrument in the lab. I can take it apart. I can make it work for what I need to do. And what that tells them is that, wow, this guy can be really good uh, person to have in the lab who can fix stuff. He's good with his hands. He can problem, problem, problem solve, troubleshoot, and he can fix instruments or machines. Um, and so that's what, that's pretty much what I did is I focused in on how I would develop these skills as a low vision researcher, low vision chemist, but then highlight them on how that could be useful um, as part of your team. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, real quickly, I'd like to take a minute to thank the sponsor of today's video, CK Mova. I featured their products on the channel before, and today we're taking a look at the SUM3 Cardioid Condenser Studio Microphone. This is a really nice, high quality studio microphone all metal construction and has some really nice features like a gain control knob, which doubles as a mute button. There's also a headphone jack for monitoring your microphone levels. And then you have a headphone volume knob as well. The microphone comes with a couple cables. You've got USB-C to USB-A 
and a USB-C to USB-C. Those two cables will allow you to plug it up to just about any kind of computer, PCs or Macs, and even smartphones that have a USB type C jack. So if you're looking for a high quality studio microphone for all types of things, podcasting, live streaming to platforms like YouTube and Twitch, even recording spots like this. I definitely recommend checking out CK Mova and in particular the Sum 3 Studio microphone. Of course I'll have more information and links to everything down in the description. Huge thank you to CK Mova for sponsoring this video and now let's get back to it. I think we're all, it's, it's nice we're all saying similar things, but I'm sure there are people out there who are having thoughts, just to play devil's advocate for a moment. Yeah. Um, the, the first thought is always, well, I don't want them, just like Fernando said, I don't want that story where somebody says, well, I wouldn't have hired you, or they don't want to tell them up front and be like, well, we don't want to interview you now. And even if, because, I mean, people will find a way not to not hire you, but not have it look like discrimination. That's that's what they yeah. feel like. You know, it's like, oh, they're not going to give me the job. I won't get it. And the other thing that I've heard from people is, well, I don't have to tell them I'm blind. I am not required by law to tell them I am disabled. You know, so you can go through the entire interview process if if it's possible. Like like you said, I can't walk in with my guide dog and sort of <laughs> write him in and be like, no, this is just my buddy. He, you know, um, <laughs> but you could go through the entire process technically and never tell them. And get the job and then be like, by the way, I need this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And so legally, no, it's just like you're not legally required to tell an Uber driver that you have a guide dog. You're not legally required to mention this. And that is true. That is a fair point. Um, and I think that's what we're saying a little bit is like, look, I'm, I'm not suggesting that there's a legal requirement. I'm suggesting that what happens to that relationship of the employer-employee if you walk in on your first day and you never mentioned this entire time, what kind of feeling are they going to get about you and your future employment at this place? So I, I know I've had lots of people, you know, tell me that like, well, I don't have to tell them, so I'm not going to. It's like, okay, cool. You know, you do that and then, you know, see what happens in the long run. Might work out. It might not. Um, that's just some of those things that people have said, you know, in the sort of devil's advocate area. Yeah. 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 I'm, no, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I was going to bring up the whole legal aspect of it. You know, if you are required to, to let them know, or if you're not required to let them know. So I'm glad you brought it up. Again, I, I was just going to add that um, for people with quote unquote invisible disabilities or those of us, you know, whether it's albinism, low vision, or it's not that apparent, I've, I've heard the same, you know, people saying, well, you know, I'm here for the role. I have the qualifications. I have demonstrated expertise and experience. That should be enough to get me to get me through the interview. Um, and yeah, in an ideal world, uh, that would be. Mm -hmm. But there are people with inherent biases. That's something that is part of what happens. Um, in fact, if you look at the statistics, um, people with disabilities are three times less likely to get hired. Um, and as well, a recent um, post, um, an article came on the news was also people with certain names. Um, they did an analysis where, you know, they would do job applications with certain names. Um, and they found that um, people uh, with, you know, people of color or African-American uh, were less likely to get hired uh, compared to, you know, their white counterparts uh, mm. for the same role. So again, you know, there are these inherent biases um, it's part, it's part of it. In fact, you know, when I was interviewing for postdoctoral positions, I was told like, Hey, um, you know, we don't have a position for you. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, I get a phone call. Hey, I just realized that you're from Puerto Rico. Therefore you're Latino. So maybe you tick this box that I need for diversity in my lab. <laughs> and I'm like, really? You just told me that? I'm like, no, I'm not going to take your job. Um, Forget so you. This is something that, that, that is always there and, and present. And so um, and to your point, you know, legally you're not required to do so. Maybe you've got the great uh, experience and expertise, but again, it's about relationships. And do you want to really start off on that awkward foot um, when, when, when entering a new role like that? I, I personally wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then to just to kind of um, share one of my own stories about the fact that uh, we're not saying that you're never going to run into discrimination, whether it's in the hiring process or post hiring. Um, you know, Fernando talked about his, um, Derek spoke about his with the school. I, my very first job was at a subway. Um, and 
a subway sandwich, you know, not like <laughs> the metro, but uh and I got the job and I worked. I worked there for for about a month or two and then they let me go and they claimed the only explanation I was given was that um they had to let someone go and since I was the most recent hire, I was the first to go. Uh now I don't know if it had anything to do with the fact that I couldn't run the cash machine, so I could make the sandwiches and all that, but then I'd have to hand it off to someone else to ring the person up. Um, you know, I, I'd like to think it doesn't have anything to do with that, but there's always that that question in the back of your mind is... Uh, just my final thoughts are to own your, remember to own your own story. It's your narrative. Uh, control, you can, you have plenty of time to control that during the interview. And again, you know, don't beat yourself up if you didn't get a job. I mean, there are a variety of reasons. I mean, you can go down different different, different paths of thinking if I got discriminated against or not. I mean, ultimately, it's about finding the right fit uh, for the role where you're going to be set up for success and where you're going to be a superstar. Yeah, I completely agree. Derek, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would just remind people that especially those that have lost their sight, you know, maybe they were sighted now they're facing a life with sight loss to remember that sight loss is not your identity. Yes, it's part of your story. It's part of your narrative, as Fernando has said so well, but it's only one part. And so you yourself are interviewing for the job, not your disability. So go in, be confident and remember that you can do this job, even if it takes a little bit different way, you are qualified, you're ready for this and don't let that disability stand in your way. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And then once again, just to piggyback off that, once you are there, be an advocate for yourself. If there's something you need, let them know and just reinforce that I will be able to do this job, uh, but I do need some assistance with it. So perfect. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, Fernando, Derek. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. I really appreciate it. And I think it was a lot of great information that hopefully people will, will enjoy and, and get some help from. Um, I will have contact information for both of these gentlemen in the description down below. Feel free to reach out to them and uh, give them some love. So <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you, you, Sam. Thanks, Sam.